Excellent. Hello there, I am Zolerla, and this is the Joy of Computer Gaming, where we investigate good, intriguing, and awful examples of computer gaming history. Today's highlighted game is Rings of Zilfin. The sadly squandered, sluggishly strolls several samey settings, slowly stab sand goos, and stutteringly shoot at self-rezzing Skullbats game. It's a role-playing adventure game originally released by SSI in 1986 for the Apple II, and later released for the Commodore 64, Atari ST, the version I played, and MS-DOS. And yes, stutteringly is totally a real word. Play this game if you don't believe me, or better just look it up in the dictionary. There are very few games that I've played through that I've loathed playing as much as this game. I continuously felt like I had to just push myself to deal with the awful traveling, holding down F to eventually flee from the night bats yet again, dealing with the dull combat, and waiting impatiently as everything seemed to be a waste of my time. I finally did reach the end of the game, but it was tough to force myself through this one. Really tough. <sighs> the look of the game is, sadly, the best part about it, so don't be fooled here. It has colorful graphics with character graphics that are very reminiscent of SSI's later but far more popular gold box games such as Pool of Radiance and Curse of the Azure Bonds. My favorite part of the game is that every single city in the game has a unique look, you really do feel like you're visiting various different cities. I think this part's great, and if only this level of detail was put into anything else about the game, we'd have a far more exciting game on our hands. The insides of the buildings are really enormous, and always look the same based on the kind of building it is. What kind of tavern has a bottom floor this large? And those temples of Dragos really are incredibly huge. No wonder those fanatics want to beat you up with sticks as you drag dirt into their lavish temples. Outside, the graphics are serviceable as you travel between cities, with simple two-layer parallaxing. It's the first game to use traveling like this so far as I'm aware. This same method of traveling has been used lately by a slew of simple idle games such as Crusaders of the Lost Idols, William the Conqueror, and Idle Pouring. The various locations you visit have a variety of fairly nice backdrops, even if most of them are repeated in numerous places. However, the dungeons are severely lacking in contrast. Three of them are just caves where you simply walk down a long, narrow passage with three set encounters in each. In the Dark Tower in Castle Graz, you walk around a very ugly, simple-looking 2D maze to find your way around. The enemies and NPCs are all fairly small since they're all relative to your character's sprite, which never changes size throughout the game. They look fanciful in some cases, but are largely nothing special. The story is laden with names of individuals, places, monsters, and races in the world of Batanik, with a Q. You only really need to know a couple to understand the plot, one being the titular Zilfins and the other being Lord Dragos. We may as well just call them the good guys and the bad guy. A long time ago, the goodly Zilfins created two rings that, when worn together, give the wearer supernatural power. The rings have disappeared, however, and no one knows where the Zilfin themselves have gone either. Conveniently, right as they disappeared, an evil necromancer known as Lord Dragos, or Lord Bad Guy, appears. With him are evil denizens from the realm of Gertex, such as demons, Zorlims, which are kind of evil wizard in cloaks and remind me of the Weavers from Loom or the Ethereals from XCOM, though those games did come out later. Goblins and a host of different flying monsters to terrorize everybody to control the population. He wants to get the Rings of Zilfin for the power they convey, and the unspecified treasure of Fulgrash for no specific reason except it's supposed to be a great amount of treasure and nobody knows where it is. Maybe? Because of his hordes of minions, everybody is forced to stay indoors at night, which has caused all traveling and trading to cease between the cities. Except for the monks, who are completely unaffected because they have an ancient spell that protects them and no one else, but all they do is stand around on the paths between locations in the world, so yeah, I don't get it either. I also don't understand why nobody could travel by ship, though the game acts like ships don't exist whatsoever, so maybe nobody in this world ever thought about traveling by sea? You play a young character that is being sought after by Dragos for one reason or another. But your dead mother talks to you into leaving your home and starting on your own adventure to stop Lord Bad Guy. She talks to you in exposition style, not like a mother would ever talk to her son. But it's not a moment too soon, because just as you leave, Lord Bad Guy's lead demon, Zoman, appears to slay you. But you've already left. Aside from the unique names for a lot of things, the plot is very generic. Things were nice with Group A in charge the very obviously good Zilfins, and now things are awful with Group B in charge, the very obviously evil Lord Dragos. And you have to fix it. 
Sadly, what bits there are that do seem original are marred by the many generic fantasy elements in the game, like having dwarves, halflings, elves, trolls, goblins, wizards, and witches in the world. The game world is split into three nations, Deloria in the south, Begonia in the east, and Samaria in the west. They translate into easy, medium, and hard difficulty regions, so you obviously start in Deloria, the easy region. The only way to get between the regions is through mountain passes because nobody ever travels by sea, remember? There's also the final location, Castle Graz, that you get to at the end of the game. The game world is fairly large, with many set locations throughout. Since most of these are just set encounters that respawn every time you visit them, this is far less exciting than it sounds. Almost everything is done through a menu on the right edge of the screen. Though the game may be controlled with the mouse, the way it moves didn't make a lot of sense to me and I ended up using the keyboard. For the keyboard, you control almost everything with the arrow keys and use Insert to choose an option and Home to cancel. I know those keys are right next to the arrow keys on the Atari ST, but even back then, just about everything supported using Enter or Space to select things and Escape to abort, so it just felt wrong even when the game came out. The whole select and unselect nature of the menus was a bit funky, particularly in combat. You would choose Sword to attack, then press an arrow key in one of the four directions, then press Insert over and over to swing. You'd choose to do something else, like cast a spell or eat a mushroom, and you had to press home, which takes you out of attack mode, which felt a bit cumbersome to use. You can instead press the first letter of the menu choice you want to use, so you can press S over and over as well to attack. On rare occasion, you'd have to press a letter to select one of the 26 item types, or a number from 1 to 8 for the mushrooms and plants. You know when you get to do either of these because you'll be looking at your character sheet, and thank goodness for that, because how the heck would you remember P is for toy or C is for a match? Well, it's not like playing fantasy on the Atari 8-bit where you had to remember obscure numbers for what spells you're casting. Or Ultima 3 where you had to remember oddly named spells and choose them by letter. Or playing Bard's Tale on the Atari ST where you had to remember four character codes for your spells, like you were doing something in an ancient AS400 system. Wait a minute. Here's what the spells look like in Rings of Zilfin. And they aren't sorted by spell level, so I guess you do have to look up something obscure. Even the names don't really help when Jazip is the level 1 damage spell, but Rektar is the level 2 damage spell, and Fagater is the level 3 one. What the heck is up with old games and spells being so obscure? Though nothing tops Draken's wonky replacement characters for casting spells that I still had trouble with when I beat that game. Maybe they were emulating Ultima 5's runes? I don't know, this happened a lot back in the day. For a role-playing game, the mechanics were very light. The game is supposed to be for beginners for role-playing games, with no character selection, no control over your progression, and ultra-simplistic mechanics. This just sounds like an excuse to make a really simplistic game. Your character has Endurance, which is your health, and Fatigue, which is your stamina. Both start out low at 250, respectively, at the hardest difficulty, and you can just buy healing over and over again to get them higher. From the beginning of the game, your maximums are 9,000. The only other game I know of that lets you just buy more health like this is Ultima 2. You have a strength which has a maximum and a current value. Swordmasters at each castle will raise the maximum, but you need a witch to raise your current strength to its maximum. Your strength is your maximum potential damage and also governs what sword you can use. Swords have a minimum strength and a maximum damage. So if you have a 39 strength, you want to get a slicer, which requires at least a 30 strength and can do up to 49 damage. But since your strength is only 39, after visiting the first castle and then raising it at a witch, you'll only do 39 damage. Once you get the second strength boost that brings you up to 69, that slicer will do 49 damage, and you'll need to buy a slayer to get up to 69 damage. The maximum damage a sword can do is 99, except pearlet flowers somehow circumvent all of this. This number never changes, by the way. You consistently do exactly one amount of damage based on your sword and strength throughout the entire game. You can buy armor, which does a flat damage reduction up to 30 damage off, but your enemies never seem to have armor, thankfully. You have a magic skill, which is completely meaningless, really. It's 0 when you're a level 0 mage, 33 at level 1, 66 at level 2, and 99 at level 3. Your magic level governs what spells you can cast. The magic skill does absolutely nothing. None of the spells change at all as you level. A level 1 novice wizard will do 5 damage with a jazip, just like a level 3 master wizard. Your sword skill starts at 25 and randomly increases by 1 after every kill, up to a maximum of 66. It takes very little time to max out the sword skill, so I'm not really sure why they bothered adding it. Its value was 1 less than the percentage chance to hit, so at the beginning of the game you only hit 26% of the time, and before long you'll hit a whopping 67% of the time, and that's the best you'll ever get! 
Miss and you do no damage, hit and you do exactly the sword and strength based amount mentioned earlier. In combat, you could choose to cast a spell, which always costs fatigue and isn't very effective. Use your bow, which is comically bad, or swing your sword at them. Spells always do the exact same damage no matter what, and your bow always just seems to suck. Attacking is you mashing the S or insert key over and over again to take swings, then occasionally an enemy will swing back. Repeat until all of them are dead or you are dead. It's very boring and doesn't get any better later in the game. Aside from combat, you'll buy and sell goods, talk to loads of NPCs, give them various items as a sort of quest system, and travel from place to place. At cities, you'll either have three buildings to visit, or two buildings and can talk to bypassers. Don't ask how bypassers make sense in a world where traveling and trading no longer exist. Doubly don't ask why kids are passing by alone. The bypassers are randomly shapeshifters that attack you instead of striking up a one-sentence conversation. The buildings are trading shops, taverns, temples of Dragos, which always have fanatics ready to beat you with their sticks, healers, armor and weapon shops, specialty trade shops, and other rare locations like witches, barbers, and fortune tellers. You have to keep track of names and things characters have said because anything can be a clue about how to complete the game, but so many of them are not obvious. There are later NPCs that expect you to put in the name of someone they might know, and you have to start typing in names and hope they are important enough that that particular name is known by that NPC. When you leave three building towns, sometimes there will be a beggar asking for money. Give them the right amount of gold and they'll give you a hint, or in towns with a wizard, they'll take you to the wizard. Because requiring a donation to a beggar is totally the way every hermit wizard needs to keep those dag-nabbed freeloading whippersnappers off their lawn. Actually, maybe there's something logical to that. Traveling takes up around 75% of the game, so you'll see this a lot. It just looks like this, with only marginal changes depending on the terrain. You can travel at four different speeds, though I have no idea why they bothered. You'll stop to get mushrooms and plants or drink the water if you want to risk getting poisoned, which takes you to zero endurance and fatigue, because that's a great gameplay mechanic. Oh yes, and there are monks along the road which say some things, some of which are pointless such as power without the price, Atari's tagline at the time, and others which give you hints required to win the game. When it gets to nighttime, you'll often be attacked by birds. These always come in a single wave of night birds that don't attack, but if any of them lives, you'll get wave after wave of some other type of flying beast that will do considerable damage to you. Once you learn Udbar the teleport spell, you'll pretty much exclusively use that to get around. Once you learn Stole the paralyze spell, almost all encounters become trivial since you can just paralyze all of your enemies for several seconds. You have bows, a sword, armor, up to 9,000 gold, food, and arrows, up to 99 of each of the mushrooms and plants, and up to 99 of the 26 different items in the game. Yes, even the fabled rings of Zilfin are included here as letter Q in the list. The various plants heal you, turn into food, or give you temporary buffs. There are four types of enemies. Ground enemies that attack you, ground enemies that hit you with spells, flying enemies, and the hurls. At first, it would seem like almost all the creativity in this game went into the enemies until you fight them and every one of them has one tactic. Attack. Ground enemies that attack you have their damage reduced by your armor and have a chance of missing you, though many hit 100% of the time and few never hit at all for some odd reason. They just stand around you up to four at a time and occasionally attack you until they all die or you die. They are goblins, fanatics, cave plants, sangus, giant spiders, demondi, shapeshifters, trolls, zoomogans, slimes, firmigons, gorgons, minus, uh, another giant spider, balzil, runs, and bogum. The only unique ability amongst them is from the giant spiders, which turn into butterflies and fly away if they successfully hit you because apparently Lord Bad Guy turned all of the butterflies into hideous giant spiders because, well, because Bad Guy. Ground enemies that attack you with spells just stand there and shoot you with the same spell over and over again, which always seem to hit and always do the same damage ignoring your armor. These are Zorlums, Zamir, the Dragon of Darkness Iblis, and Lord Bad Guy himself. I think Bargs also fall into this category since they always seem to hit, though they're not using a spell. Flying enemies are either the variety of night flyers that all do the exact same thing, which is fly across the screen twice and shoot you remotely, or the ones guarding specific locations, such as the passes, which just hover around, dive at you on occasion, and die over and over again because they can raise themselves from the dead, according to the manual. There's a long list of how they're all unique, except they really aren't. They all act exactly the same, and they all die, in quotes, in one shot. 
They just look different and have different names. And lastly are the Hrolls, which you encounter in the Dark Tower and Castle Graz while wandering the Tile maze-like passages. They are immune to everything except a specific spell which requires a specific staff to cast. This makes the battles with them look incredibly enthralling. You just spam casting while they hit you. Fun. There's a brief intro song with a single scene in the background. I don't know if it goes on any longer because the game just jumps right in and asks for disc 2, aborting the music. Otherwise, there's no real music in the game. Sure, you play a flute twice in one part and blow a horn in another, but those last a few seconds and they aren't particularly interesting. The sounds are very minimalistic and just barely fulfill their purpose. You'll hear the success doo-doo over and over again, sometimes many times in a row, such as when you meet the Zilfin. And again when you meet the elves. The game often pauses or delays based on the sounds, such as the flying birds hitting you with a spell, or the maddening amount of time it takes to get hit by a K-plant. The most memorable sound in the game is when you talk to a monk. What is that sound supposed to represent anyways? I know my transition screen says it may contain spoilers. In this case, this whole section is laden with spoilers. This is one of the worst games I've had to endure, but you may want to just skip ahead to the version section if for some odd reason this game sounds interesting enough to sink 30 or more hours mm. into. I'm not even bringing up bugs here, just my grievances with the game. Wait for the extra section for a vast list of bugs and actual flaws in the game. So many elements of this game seem to be designed simply to waste your time. I played the game with the processor at double speed because it is horridly slow at the default processor speed and only incredibly slow when sped up. The double processor speed quite literally doubled the speed the game runs at since they didn't code it to sync with the video card at all and it's still too slow for most of the game. In this section I'm going to be showing examples at the real speed unless otherwise specified. Every location you visit shows your character slowly wander into the location. When you're in a city, every building you visit shows your character slowly trundling up to it. It's not so bad the first couple of times, but it does this throughout the entire game at every city you ever visit. Every time you go into a temple of Dragos, you make your way to the center of the room and get ambushed like this. Or whenever you walk into a tavern, you have to do this. Except if you make a mistake and press N three times, your character leaves and you have to restart. Realize also with taverns, if you're resting the game the whopping 50 fatigue more than once, your character completely leaves the building and goes back to the center of town before you gain control again. I did this four times in Lorem just to see how long it takes to gain 200 fatigue using an inn, and the answer is over three minutes. The best way to raise endurance and fatigue is at some of the later healers, except they're excruciating slow to visit as well. Here's me and Fairlot using the healers twice. When you decide to get healed, at first the three healers plod towards you for several seconds. Then your health slowly increases. Then you completely leave the building, so you have to walk back up to it again if you want to get healed again. From the moment I arrived in town to when the two healings were done and I had control again, it took over two and a half minutes. When you visit a witch to raise your strength, it raised by random amounts so you repeat giving them Prinny over and over again. I don't have a video of this at the normal speed to show how slow it really is, but since it's sound based I doubt it's much slower. Thankfully with witches you don't have to leave the building entirely to repeat it. In many places like the caves you get very slow animations. Here's excitedly sliding down a rope for an entire 23 seconds. No wait, no wait, that was sped up, shoot. Here's you excitedly sliding down that same rope at the correct speed for an entire 46 seconds. I wish I was exaggerating. Well then you slowly walk up to the cave entrance and then slowly walk down the straight path and you get the idea. It's all amazingly slow. Near the end of the game, from the moment you choose to blow the horn to when you actually land, it takes over 90 seconds. Over a minute of that is just watching the birds sluggishly fly over some mountains like this. I was going to have the entire thing play just to prove the point, except it'd be way, way too long, and you've already had to suffer with me talking about this game in the first place. On a completely different note, the battles are really slow, particularly when there are more enemies. 
This gets to the point of being nearly painfully slow, especially near the beginning of the game where you might actually die. Take the K-plants, for example, which have to grow through multiple phases with this slow, tedious sound that you know is just going to hurt. And when it finally very slowly shoots your character, you can finally get a couple more attacks in before the other one starts doing this. Why can't you just dodge this incredibly slow plant shooting venom at you? Or just, say, walk away? <sighs> I'll get back to the combat in a moment. Oh, and since I died during this battle, the game kicked me out to toss, which it does every time you die. If I was on my real ST, I'd have to switch back to the first disc and reload the entire game again to be able to then load my save and then be able to play again. Traveling from place to place is most of the game. It's so boring. You pick up stuff, talk to monks, sure, sure. Except before long, you don't need to do either of those. There's water if you want to have to reload the game every time you find poison, because that's essentially what the game is doing for you. Poison! Time to reload the entire game! Glad I just wasted at least a few minutes of your time! If you happen to have an Iola flower, you could eat that and get restored, but they're rare. There's so little to do while traveling, mm -hmm. and it just eats up so much time. Later games, such as Darkest Dungeon, may have a similar travel method, but it adds things to react to and far more interesting battles to keep you engaged while you're playing. Remember those idle games I brought up earlier looking like this traveling, such as idle pouring? Those games do this sort of view and play for you, because the people that made the newer games realize how boring this is. And why are there multiple walking speeds? You can easily get to your maximum fatigue of 9,000, so who cares if you occasionally lose 8 fatigue versus 2 fatigue? Is it really worth saving a few fatigue to have to spend even more time with this awful traveling system? And then night comes, and you can go really slow, or you can try to rest. In either case, you generally get to enjoy fighting the wretched nightbirds. We'll get back to the nightbirds. If you rest, it will make the night pass by a lot faster. If you use a match, you'll light a fire, which will give you 50 fatigue instead of just 10 if you don't get attacked. If you don't rest or you flee from the nightbirds, you'll be very slow the next day because you're tired. But the game won't let you rest during the day. Wouldn't it make more sense to rest during the day when the only danger that may attack you comes during the night? as opposed to trying to rest at night and hoping you wake up before the nightbirds kill you in your sleep? While traveling, time also passes while you're just moving your character's position to talk, pick up things, or drink and get poisoned. You can lose an entire day just being indecisive. The very first step you take while traveling makes you go five miles because they couldn't figure out how to code it properly to start you off at zero and not cost two fatigue immediately. It always costs two fatigue immediately, unless you wasted the entire way picking things up and talking to monks and getting poisoned, which can happen, so then it's night and you're tired from moving back and forth picking things up and talking to people, so then you walk really slowly and only lose zero stamina. Lucky you! Even so, some things are always out of reach because you can't go to the edge. Why did they make it this way? Because screw you, that's why. Not only that, but you don't know when you're about to reach the next location, so if you don't try to snag things the moment they appear on screen, you may have missed them. Apparently your character is incapable of firing off a second brain cell to think, oh hey, I should gather these plants before I wander into this wondrous forest scene to enjoy being ever so slowly pillaged to death by K-plants. It's probably because they've all leaked out his nose after several days of boredom on the road that maybe standing between two plants known to shoot people would be a great idea instead of, I, I don't know, walking away the freaking plants and I just, I'm getting off topic. Here's a map I made of the various locations and the routes between them. It takes two to five minutes each path if you can stomach the full travel and not speed up the emulator. You'll travel almost every path to almost every location at least once to complete the game. And if you're me, you'll travel every path at least twice, just to catalog how long it is each direction because they aren't even consistent in each direction. Going from Chantel to Southwest Burgle Plains is 50 miles, but going from Southwest Burgle Plains back to Chantel is 40. Going from Middle Tiveron to Tiveron East is 30 miles, but it's only 15 going back. This only happens on most paths to Tiveron East or Southwest Burgle Plains, but the fact it happened at all is sad. I hate this game. Speaking of distances, how the hell were these distances chosen? I mean, look at 216 to 219. That's a sizable distance and comes out to 40 miles in game. But somehow 219 to 220 comes out to 35. Some paths have crazy long distances to travel for tiny movements on the map, such as 215 to 217, which are 20 miles apart which is half the distance of 216 to 219? 
Comparing these to Deloria is even more silly, since 7 to 8 is only 20 miles, as is 15 to 19. How does this work? In short, when you get to be a third level wizard and you can just cast the teleport spell, it's all you'll do to get around. Losing 90 fatigue is totally worth avoiding all of the crap that happens when you actually travel. Oh yeah, the best part about traveling. The Nightbirds. In a word, they're atrocious. A deplorable excuse at padding the gameplay that just ends up pissing you off. At the real speed or at the sped up rate, these battles suck. They're marginally more manageable at the real speed, but I'm not going to suffer those slow speeds for everything else just to make these battles marginally better. You need to buy arrows. Every shot costs an arrow. You'll never find it again. But you can also break one of your U-bows shooting at them, so you have to buy plenty of extra bows, at least until you get the Brom bow near the end of the game that never breaks. The birds are very difficult to hit properly. The one spot it looks like you'd be able to just shoot them easily when they fly down on their simple path, your arrows just fly right through them. Or the game won't let you move into that position. When one of them is dying, the others all slow down and the falling corpse can absorb a further shot or two of yours. And then they speed up the fewer of them there are on screen, like this is some sort of deranged version of Space Invaders. And when they hit you with a spell, everything pauses, even your arrow mid-flight, which can completely ruin your chances of actually hitting one of them. I hate this game. So how do I deal with them? I flee. No, hear me out, because this is great. You see, you hold down the F key to flee, and then the game tells you that the fleeing failed. Over and over again. Until suddenly, it doesn't fail, and you lose a little fatigue. See? Much better than wasting a bunch of gold on ammo and bows and getting blasted by spells. Except that then you walk really slowly. Still better than finding the damn nightbirds, though. There is another variety of bird that shows up at certain locations, such as the passes. They just bob around and dive at you on occasion, but the greatest part is that when you kill one, they self-resurrect. So you basically have to kill them again and again, which is tits on a dragon stupid. I'm pretty sure this is how the creators of the game got around the fact that one shot kills a bird. So yeah, let's have them resurrect themselves so they'll take one more shot. That's really creative, right? You'll see them die, then bloop, right back again like nothing happened. This'll be engaging and fun gameplay at its finest. Uh, yeah, also, while any of them is dying, you can't press the shoot button because it'll just get soaked up, making it an even slower experience. If you flee from these battles, you just leave the location if it's not a pass. But if it's a pass, you turn around and don't pass the pass. Ground battles are generally just sword, 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 get hit, sword, 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 get hit. They are slow and tedious and completely unfun. You don't even do random amounts of damage unless you count the permanent 33% chance of missing as zero damage instead of whatever damage you do. And if you have to attack up or down, you move really slowly compared to left or right. Why... why animate it like this? And why do you flop your sword up and down like you're chopping through foliage in the jungle whenever you're attacking downwards? Why any of this? If you ever try to cast a spell you don't have, the game doesn't tell you anything about it and just lets the enemies attack you for free. The same thing happens if you left your teleport spells your last selected spell, which happened a lot near the end of the game for some odd reason. At that point it turns into a lose a turn spell. The only way to know what spell you have selected is to look at your inventory. There is a flee option during ground battles. It never works. You can never flee. You're forced to fight every gruelingly slow slug of a battle. This also might as well just be a lose a turn key. And why are there damage spells at all? They do so little damage it's laughable. And they suck fatigue constantly. I can only vaguely get using them in place of arrows if you run out of arrows or bows because they're all broke, but they're pretty cheap so that shouldn't happen really. The only useful spell in combat is Stole, the Paralyze spell. It paralyzes all of your enemies and is so helpful that even one of the NPCs in Varnlim mentions you should get it. Another addition you only get near the end of the game, however, since it's a level 3 spell. Except then your battles are even more boring because you get to witness your endgame character just stab at and miss stationary targets without the exciting retaliatory damage coming back. Battles in many older games were more intriguing, like Ultima 3 or Alternate Reality of the City, Bard's Tale, or SSI's own fantasy. Sure, those are all turn-based examples, but their battles were so much more interesting because there was actually some decision-making to do. It's not like Rings of Zilfin is doing anything that necessitates real-time combat except to give the enemies more attacks on you because you chose the wrong option in the menu or you tried to cast a spell you don't have. Hey, they could have just implemented that in a turn-based system anyways. The prices are all over the place, with some things selling for far, far more than you buy them for. It doesn't take a genius to take advantage of this and have way more money than you ever need. 
I only kept buying new commodities to guarantee that I'd have tons of gold no matter what. Even at the very beginning of the game, you can buy tobacco for 55 gold each, up to 99 of them, of course, and sell them two locations away at 130 gold each. The worst offender is tea, which you can buy near the beginning of the game for 30 gold each and sell near the end of the game for 375 gold each, a 345 gold per item profit, or an 1150% ROI. Spice and silk are nearly as profitable. In short, aside from the very beginning of the game, you never have to worry about money. However, if you don't pay attention to how much gold you're receiving, your character can't handle more than 9,000 gold, so any access is just thrown away. Aside from special trade houses, you have to guess what to sell things for, and then haggle to settle upon the price. You can try to haggle all you want without repercussions, so why is this even a feature of the game at all? Why waste our time yet again? It's not even like haggling actually changes the maximum the shopkeeper is willing to pay anyways. Sometimes you can even haggle when buying, but it seemed pretty random and I only really saw it happen in Begonia. The same thing applies, it's a waste of time, so who really cares when money is so easy to come by? In the game, you can purchase the best armor for 550 to 850 gold, depending on where you buy it. Since you start off the game building up money in a shop selling the best armor is available right next to one of the cities on the starting trade route, it makes sense to buy it as soon as possible. There are three kinds of armor, which reduce 5 damage for light, 15 damage for medium, and 30 for heavy. Since heavy is so cheap, you just go straight for it, and then suddenly the game hits easy mode. With this armor, almost nothing hurts you at all in Deloria, the easy region. You'll see lots of hit for zero messages from most enemies there. Since you can buy this armor from several places in the world, this means that all sorts of normal people could be wearing this armor. So why are those people afraid to travel? Yeah, I may have this heavy armor so strong that goblins can't touch me, but doing a 20 mile jog to the next town is beyond me. Eh, yeah, the more I think about it, the more plot holes this game has. There are two downsides to the armor. By the end of the game, the enemies are doing 150 or so damage, so with your 30 reduction, you're only taking 120 damage a hit. Okay, but not great. But also, so many endgame enemies like Hrolls, Zamirs, and all those various nightbirds do magic attacks which just ignore your armor anyways. The damage dealt by the flying craters at the passes lowers by armor, though. While going through the pass to Begonia, the medium region, the various flying creatures couldn't even hurt me. So why did I have to fight them? I should have been able to just walk through unimpeded. In villages, there are only two kinds of buildings and an option to talk to bypassers. It's always the same four kinds of bypassers. A dwarf, a halfling, an old man, and a kid. They always have to slowly walk all the way up to you. Then you talk, and then they slowly walk away. Any one of them may be a shapeshifter in disguise, which is very easy to dispatch, so I don't even know why they would bother. The order the bypassers appear in is completely random. You could end up getting just the dwarf over and over again trying to talk to, say, the kid to see what he has to say. Or if you want the dwarf to show up because he'll take you to the past of the next nation, you could endlessly just get the old man. They could have simply had them rotate the four options without changing anything really, but nah, waste our time some more, please, Rings of Zilfin. If you remember, all travel and trading is supposed to have stopped. So why are there bypassers? Why are there kids traveling by themselves regardless? Absolutely all of them say they can't talk to strangers, which is why you have to hand out toys like some sort of traveling hero clause. But hey, traveling around the goblin and nightbird infested roads, which are covered with various nearly instant death poison? Totally okay. You know what would be an easy change and what actually makes sense? Just have it be talk to villagers instead. No other change is necessary, just a single word change, and you're talking to the villagers. Poof! I fixed that plot hole. You have a giant list of items in a pretty much random order with a letter of the alphabet for each. You can have up to 99 of them, though a couple are set quest items you can only get one of. However, many of the one-use items are treated like regular commodities that you can buy up to 99 of for no particular reason except that it would be harder to code. The keys and ropes come to mind since you only ever need one of each of them. I bought up tons of keys, for example, in case they sold somewhere else in the game. Not like money is hard to come by anyways, but nope, no such luck. In fact, come to think of it, why are there 99 keys for the mythical Treasure of Fulgrash for me to buy? I can just imagine Trader Ben here snickering the whole time. Oh sure, I can sell 99 of them. Good thing I have 99 of them just lying around to sell. 59 for to gold, please. The game requires you to press insert instead of return to confirm almost everything. However, regularly a message will come up that says return, such as when you talk to an NPC or an event like being robbed happens. For those, you are permitted to press return, but insert works there as well. The graphics used for other characters are very limited and not particularly distinct. 
The dwarves you meet are the same height as you, the halflings only a couple pixels shorter, as are the elves in Zilfen. You largely know they're different due to the clothing they're wearing, and the game always tells you that they're a dwarf, halfling, elf, or Zilfen when you talk to them. One thing I hated was having to keep so many notes for the game to play it properly. You have to keep track of names, what everyone says, because they largely just tell you how to play the game and where you met them. There really are questionnaires on this stuff as you play, as some key items will only be given to you if you can tell certain characters names of other people you've met. The thing is, these names are very forgettable and almost seem to have been made through some sort of generator, and so many are very similar. Bon Bidon is a dwarf in Meridum. Bon is a dwarf in Varandlem. But Bon Deer is the owner of the weapon shop in Trail Ohm, and Ben is the trader in Derry Min. Then Bin is the trader in Telbiz, and Bun Belly is a halfling in Chantil, whereas Bim is a kid in Finduk. That's not even all the names that start with B, just the ones that sound similar. Not only that, but there are two Pruk the Kids, one in Fairlot, which is in Begonia, and one in Safinus, which is in Samaria. Is this kid gifted with the power of the monks to allow him to travel so far and through the mountain pass at Caradum? I know from personal experience that the path from Fairlot to Safinus is a long and arduous one, with the shortest path being... Go 25 miles southeast, past the goblin ambush to the desert of Eridrim South, which is defended by four powerful Sangus. Go 15 miles southwest to Lorem, where you can at least rest in the homebrew inn for three gold, though every time I have, I've been robbed for significantly more gold afterwards. Go 30 miles southwest, yes, this tiny journey is 30 miles, to Demian Forest, which is guarded by two rather powerful cave plants. Go 20 miles southwest to South Demian, where there are some friendly dwarves drinking ale around a fire near a cave you can't enter. Go 25 miles southwest through some swamp, so be certain to have boots for it, past a full goblin ambush of four to the Bridge of Shrill, where a fairly easy Demondi attacks you. Go 25 miles west through more swamp to Karadum, where you have to talk to bypassers until Barbunny the Dwarf shows up to take you through the Pass of Felek. Then make it through the pass fighting some trolls, Guzus, Basurs, and Drahins. Other than the trolls, these all self-resurrect, so you have to kill each of them multiple times. This will leave you at northeast of Abab Desert, where there are some more friendly dwarves drinking ale around a fire near a different cave you can't enter. Go 35 miles southwest to the desert of Abab East, which has four more powerful Songus than the ones back in Eridrim, followed by five Guzus, which you may remember showed up in the pass also, and they self-resurrect. Always fun to deal with. Finally, go 40 more miles to the southeast, past a two-goblin ambush, and we at last reach our destination, Safinus. Just for comparison purposes, I took my endgame character through this journey just to see what it does to someone traversing this distance. I started at 9000 Endurance and Fatigue in Fairlot, and I did rest in Lorem, but I ran at normal processor speed and didn't use the teleport spell because no matter how you look at this Pruk, the kid isn't going to have that spell. At the end, I had 8299 Endurance and 8898 Fatigue due to resting to pass the knights away and killing enemies quickly. I would have taken more damage if the game weren't also really easy. How long did it take in real life? Over 28 minutes, about half the length of this video, just to make that single journey. After all of that, what does Pruk do? Well, just a normal thing in the game. In Fairlot, he tells us to offer her a pearl, referring to Zara and Begonia. There's conveniently a shop in Fairlot that sells the pearl. In Safinus, he mentions the pass from Shimmer, referring to the pass back to Deloria, which is actually called the Pass of Dare, but it's located in the edge of the Shimmer Forest. So is Pruk saying he regularly also travels to Deloria as well? Man, this kid gets around. Or, you know, it could just be two kids with the same name, right? Nah, that doesn't happen in Batnik. It's not like the weapon men in, say, Zied and Shaktir are both named Guard or something. Uh, oh, wait. On a completely unrelated note, when you're in a town, there is a look command. It never, ever does anything, so why is it there? When you reach the final king, Hamdi, in Castle Rimline, and aside from the specific name drops, you are given the most generic fantasy dialogue that sounds like it could fit into almost any other fantasy game. Your name and your mission are not unknown to us. We have heard that many enemies of this realm found their end upon meeting you. You have our gratitude for keeping our hopes alive. We would like to offer you Brahm, an enchanted bow that's been in my family's possession for many years. It will be a true match to your skill and courage. You must find a way to reach Castle Graz and destroy Dragos, the Lord of Darkness. Unfortunately, it is not possible to reach Graz on foot. Ancient books mention the giant Anka birds that could carry men over the deadly mountains of Dragonia, but only the elves possessed the knowledge to summon Ankas, and now they have vanished from the land. Perhaps you will succeed in locating the elves and acquire their guidance. Good luck, insert name here. Wait a second, the Deadly Mountains of Dragonia? Is Lord Dragos named after the mountains? 
Or is it the other way? How does this make any s- Ugh. The ending was also really boring. When you finally reach Lord Bad Guy, you use the elixir which makes you look like Lord Bad Guy's master, Ligorn. Say the right words that the monks around Sumeria know for some strange reason, and he just gives you his ring. With the two rings of Zilfin, you turn him into a pile of ash. Some congratulation text appears, then you're dumped to toss. And this game is also incredibly easy. Aside from a couple deaths right at the beginning due to starting on the hardest difficulty and deliberately going to hard locations, I never even felt particularly threatened by anything. Combat was a chore more than a challenge. The game sold itself as a role-playing game for beginners. It was far closer to an hour-long adventure game with loads of additional boring travel segments and ridiculous combat scenes and sluggishness added throughout to stretch it to a 30 or more hour affair. Figuring out how to get through the game and what item to use where was the best gameplay the game had, and even that wasn't fun or interesting. It just required keeping lots and lots of notes, over 150k of text in my case. I hate this game. I hate that I made myself play through it. The last couple of times I tried to push through it, I ended up giving up pretty quickly for a reason. I hate the traveling, and it is most of the game. I hate the really dull battles and dealing with the infuriating nightbirds. I hate that I had to keep copious notes to make any goddamn sense out of this game, or to get through the various parts of it. I hate that even with my enormous amount of notes that one NPC mentions you need at least four chuba and I promptly forgot, and got incredibly pissed when I got to the end of the game and only had two chuba and couldn't finish the game then. Speaking of which, why the freaking hell does Ugru the Halfling, who just passes by when you're in Waylong, happen to know the exact amount of a drug to use on the killer tree outside the final castle, in the middle of the mountains even, to put it to sleep? Why did I even just have to say that sentence? The only thing that caused me to push through this game was the hope that one day I could make this video and share my discontent about it. I don't get it. I don't get why people like this horrible little game. How is this fun for anybody? There are so many bugs, logical errors, and textual mistakes in the game. Of course, I can forgive the textual mistakes since I don't think anybody on the team speaks English as their native language. Lots of the errors occur during the really simplistic traveling sections. When you first get into a swamp, or even if you start traveling while in a swamp, you can't immediately put on your boots to protect you from getting damaged. In fact, even after the first no boots message that saps some of your fatigue, you still can't always put on your boots and have to wait until it says it and takes some fatigue a second time. In Samaria, while traveling on many paths that are definitely not a swamp at all, the no boots message and fatigue drop will happen at the beginning of the trip. At no point mm. can you do anything about this because you aren't actually in a swamp and you can't put your boots on to react to it. It usually only dings you once, but it's still really annoying. This happens when going east from northeast of Abab Desert or going south or east from the desert of Daraz Mac North. In Samaria, in a few places, such as going east from Metsini Plains, the monks will say things from Begonia instead of Samaria. Mm some of which aren't even relevant to Samaria at all. Speaking of monks, whenever you talk to a monk, part of their sound effect just keeps going and going. It doesn't stop until another sound effect stops it. This is noticeable in quite a few of the videos I played before this, if you hear the sound going on in the background. Sometimes the sound would follow me into town and I'd hear it until something in town caused a sound, like giving Prinny to the switch. When shooting at the night birds at the left edge of the screen, when they're moving down, your arrows will sometimes just go right through them and you can never catch them again afterwards. When bypassers turn into shapeshifters, you have another problem. You can still press the T key to actually talk to them as if they were in the form they were originally shifted into. You still have to fight the shapeshifter, however. But be careful doing this, because sometimes talking to a shapeshifter will cause the game to completely crash. Then there are the display glitches. There are quite a lot of these when traveling down the roads, but one time a Zorlam hit me with a spell so hard, my hand and foot got burned into the background and I spawned new ones to compensate. When I was fighting four Sangus in Samaria, my sword kept being chopped off by the Sangu on the left, undrawing the background but ignoring my character. Watch my sword change size. Long, short, long, short. There are numerous Z-Index glitches in fights, mostly when there's a fourth enemy in the bottom space. You're drawn right over them, even though you should be drawn behind them. The Z-Indexing shows up again when there are hovering birds attacking you. When one dives, the background behind it gets drawn over other birds in front of it. When you're attacked by goblins, it's really obvious the right goblin's attack animation is just a mirror image of the left goblin's, because his flail and shield switch hands as he attacks. The menu doesn't always highlight properly. I tried to cast the ID spell, then go back to attack with my sword. I ended up casting the ID spell a second time because I couldn't switch to sword mode like I usually did. 
Then when I pressed S again, it actually did switch to my sword, but showed cast still highlighted. So I kept pressing insert and was using my sword even though insert looks like it should have been making me cast. If you're in the tower or castle grass and hit a space with rolls, but the space behind you is a wall, one of the rolls show up over the wall behind you. When you first see left in the wizard, he's an owl. It flies over to the table next to you, then turns into a person. But the bird's right wing, on our left, is still there after the transformation. When you change into Ligorn in front of Dragos, the bottom pixels of Dragos get cut out and you see the background instead. So you also chop his feet off when you transform. And on your character sheet at the upper right corner it says day one, the entire game. I don't know if there actually is a day counter or if this is a display error, but it seems a silly thing to have left in there. Though I didn't even notice it until I finished the game was writing the script because it's that unimportant. Your sword supposedly governs how much damage you do along with your strength. If you get to 99 strength but do not have a weapon that has a maximum damage of 99, you won't do 99 damage, you'll do the maximum damage of your weapon. However, the Perlet Flower supposedly give you 200 strength for one attack, which wouldn't do anything because your weapon isn't strong enough. Further complicating this is if you cast Ekbert to get information on your enemies, the strength value listed is how much damage they will do, regardless of how they attack you, with or without a weapon, or even with a spell. Strength here simply means how much damage they will do. I really wish I could get one of those flails, the goblins, that hit me for 110 damage get to use. And since when are goblins stronger than a human could possibly be? In what universe? Apparently this one. The worst, for me, is getting stuck in the rooms in the Dark Tower in Castle Grass. First off, you have to guess what direction to go. Then, if it has a special lock, the game only says, Door can't be opened from inside. Which tells you crap all. When I got to this point, I knew you needed Nook for something in the Dark Tower, but it isn't specified what except that you'll get trapped. But the text this shows gives you no hints at all, and I was stuck here for a stupidly long time. It doesn't help that the menu really glitches out and the game seems broken at this point. This, more than anything else, royally pissed me off when I was playing. When I finally figured it out by using Nook, I was livid. Stupid goddamn freaking worthless wording. Almost as frustrating was getting to the treasure of Fulgrash and not knowing what you're supposed to do there. You have to remember the name of the monster you kill there is guarding it and that's what the key is for because nothing here tells you. When you try to get the chest at the end, all the game tells you is, chest is too heavy. Yeah, great. And? It's not like open is a menu choice here. No, you're supposed to realize it's the treasure and use the key here. So what was it that everybody was looking for? A thousand gold, 40 gems, and a harp, which is just a quest item. Why was Lord Bad Guy trying so hard to get this treasure? A thousand gold and 40 gems are nothing, and the harp is something you just give to the elves to get the horn to be able to get to the castle Lord Dragus is already at. So why would he give a damn? If you get to Lord Bad Guy and don't know the words after you drink the elixir, you're kinda stuck. You just look like Ligorn the entire time. It doesn't seem to matter what you say if it isn't correct, the game just lets you keep trying. I also let Lord Bad Guy kill me, since at that point I'm technically delivering pretty much everything he has ever wanted to him, including the second ring of Zilfin. I was hoping for an alternate failure kind of ending like XCOM gives if you fail on the final mission. Even some simple text about Dragos having ultimate power now that he has both rings would have been nice, but nope. When you find the treasure of Fulgrash, the game calls you Rias, which is the default name for the character in the game. But my character's name is Zor, so the name was hard-coded here. Lufton, the most powerful wizard in the land, apparently has awful grammar, doesn't complete his sentences, and can't even spell possession properly. Here's what meeting him looks like. Hello, Zor. Shape of an owl was not best suited for what we must do. Please have a sit. I will now train. Oh yeah, look at this room. Where would I have a sit? On the table? On the floor? My character doesn't move. You are now a level 3 wizard. Now listen to me carefully. When you face Lord Dragos, you must fool him and gain possession of the... There are so many typos throughout the game that I just gave up cataloging them. So here's a few examples. In Begonia, some monks spelled marshes with a C. In Samaria, some monks use the wrong two. The first wizard, Eklun, has trouble spelling taught if you go back and visit him. Most of Ali Adebek's later games are in the same universe as Rings of Zilfin, which are the later The Magic Candle trilogy, The Keys to Maraman, Siege, Ambush at Sornor, and Bloodstone, an epic dwarven tale. Of them, I've only ever played Siege, though the first Magic Candle was very well received when it came out. These games include lots of the same names and terms used in Rings and Zilfin, such as the Zorlims, Zumagen, Farmagons, Bargs, the various mushrooms and plants, albeit with new names and slightly different effects, and so on. However, the Zilfin themselves seem to be absent, at least from the manuals. Hmm, Magic Candle. 
like the Candle of Zilfin, which never seems to show up in Rings of Zilfin. Oh, random monks say, burn O Candle of Zilfin, while Candle the Halfling, and Safinus says, we are safe while the candle burns, and Betos the Halfling, and Fairlot says, Candle of Zilfin, protect us. In the Rings of Zilfin manual, it mentions the candle as well with a blessing. It seems like none of this has anything to do with the game, but I wonder if it's supposed to be the same candle. Didn't mention I kept a lot of notes for this freaking game. This is the Apple II version, which is the original version of the game, released in 1986. It starts with a 40 second intro sequence that doesn't seem to be skippable and doesn't represent the game at all, except perhaps in how slow it is. Unlike other versions of the game, you do not get to choose a difficulty level. You are forced to start at what later versions would designate the hardest difficulty, with only 200 endurance and 50 fatigue. I played this version for about an hour and a half and didn't get very far because I didn't want to spend a couple more hours grinding enough health to survive the Telbiz to Paramon trade route. Right off, we notice that the graphics here are much more simplistic. The locations seem to be drawn by basic style graphics routines, complete with pattern flood fills for extra colors. Then the slow moving around of the location begins that we've come to appreciate from the ST version. Each location still seems to be unique, it just takes a long time to draw them, and they look nothing like the same locations of the ST version. The menu that's always present in the ST version isn't here. You'll need your manual to know what keys to press and what to do in certain situations, which I had to do because the controls aren't the same, such as pressing space to start walking when traveling instead of W. When bits of text appear, the game asks you to press return to continue, so that's where the ST version got that from. However, if you press return again afterwards, as a mistake or due to frustration that the slowness can't be skipped, the game queues that up and immediately presses it for you once the next blurb of text appears, skipping it right off. You also don't see your endurance and fatigue while traveling or attacking, but the game does tell you in parentheses whenever you take damage or lose fatigue. Traveling is very simplistic looking in comparison. It doesn't matter where your character is on the screen, the moment you start walking it'll move you to the same spot, not quite in the center. Moving your character side to side is pretty fast at least. Doing actions such as drinking or getting mushrooms uses the arrow keys instead of U and D like the ST version. One notable thing here is that the positions of the monks, water, mushrooms, and so on are all the same. Since I kept copious notes of all of this for the starting area, I know where the good water is, what monks are where, etc. It still doesn't help much though. In the ST version, some monks said, power without the price, the slogan of Atari at the time. In this version, they say, Apple II forever. There are no transitions from day or night or vice versa. At night, my experience with fighting the nightbirds is a bit... special. They are moving much slower here and are much easier to hit, at least when your bow doesn't break. I did the start of the game twice, and once the bow broke right after the ninth shot, and the other time it broke the very first shot. Actually, the first game I accidentally fired a couple arrows off into the daytime sky right after starting because of course you can shoot arrows when there's nothing there to shoot. Needless to say, I didn't test shooting birds much. However, because fleeing the nightbirds is just as stupid in this version, in my first playthrough I held down the F key to flee, just like I would in the ST version. When I finally succeeded, I saw a bunch of text appear, then day happened, and right away it was night again, and oh look, more nightbirds. This was really confusing, so I tried to flee again to get further in the game, and the days kept vanishing like this, and then I died from being out of fatigue. In other words, hold down F to fail. When I did the second game, I tapped F repeatedly to flee, because as I said, my bow broke after the very first shot. This prevented my character from wasting the day away, doing F all. I finally reached Telbiz, which spends 10 seconds slowly drawing, then showing my character meander into town. Each building just shows an overlay in the upper right as you walk into them. The trader is about the same, but resting in the inn is a lot faster. However, buying up food and resting a couple of times with one gold left, when I left, I got robbed of nine gold. Wait. Where'd the other eight gold come from? Did the thief stick eight gold in my pocket just to say I stole from him first, then pull out all nine in there? Seems a rather sad way to make a single gold piece. I tried traveling down to Zayed a few times, since there's a healing water spot on the way to get my health up a bit. However, I'd be fighting night birds and fleeing from them because I have to get to Zayed to even buy another bow, and then instantly the game would say I died. But without any information on how or why I died. Apparently I was running out of food. This was before I bought the food and had nine of my one gold stolen. Why didn't the game say, you've starved to death? In fact, why would going one day without food kill you? I've done this before and I guarantee you I'm not dead. Well, when I recorded this video anyways. The battles are even more tedious than before. 
You have to press S and then the direction to attack every time. The game just says S when you press S, not being particularly helpful here. Goblins and Fanatics are just simple two-frame animations that move towards you and away from you to attack. They don't even properly align, so when they change width, the sprites just seem to spaz out badly. Eh. You and the monsters are also simply monochrome images, the false colors showing up due to artifacting. They're just zored onto the screen, so when they overlap, they turn black. Yet, still combat is slower in this version than the ST version. After grinding a bit of health and mushrooms, I bought some tobacco and set forth towards Perimin, knowing that I'd have to deal with K-plants on the way. I only had around 600 endurance, but there are healers in Perimin I could get fixed up there because I'd have a bit of money by then. When I reached Feldor Forest to start the fight, I knew this was a mistake. The K-plants are just as tedious to fight in this version. During the ensuing exciting four-minute battle, the K-plants wiped out all of the health that I had, and the last one ended up killing me. This is still the same game, with mostly the same core problems, a slew of new problems, terrible graphics, and horrible sounds, on the rare occasion there are sounds. I wouldn't even give this version a 1 out of 10. I hate it so much. And this is the original that someone, somewhere, felt was worthy of not only being ported to three other systems, but even being given revamped graphics for the Atari ST version. This is the Commodore 64 version, released in 1986. I spent over two hours with this gem, though the first half hour of that was just trying to get it to work. I had to find alternate discs to even get it to load, though it takes over three minutes to load. Yay for C64 drive speeds. In fact, throughout the game, that's what I noticed the most. The dreadful loading times. I think during playing the game, I was sitting, staring at a blank loading screen for about 25% of the time. It loads when you enter locations. It loads when leaving locations. Sometimes it loads for a while when day turns into night while you're traveling. You may also need to swap discs regularly as well. I played the game on the easiest difficulty because I didn't want to have to grind for endurance and fatigue yet again. Then I waited during 52 seconds of loading, before the intro sequence started. We noticed right away that our endurance and fatigue are visible on the left at least, unlike the Apple II version, but on the opposite side is the ST version. It will show menu choices there as well. After the introduction, we only have to wait through 14 seconds more loading before the first traveling section, which turned out to be really short, like less than 20 seconds to get there short, before we then get to do 45 seconds more loading with a disc swap as well, and we get to Telvis. At least the location scene drawing is really fast, though I'd rather trade these horrible loading times for some slow drawing. When you start off, you can choose to change the direction keys. I chose something somewhat resembling sanity on my keyboard, maybe some people are okay with these ridiculous defaults. Much to my dismay, however, I found that during the travel sequences you can't just hold the arrow keys down to act, you have to tap them over and over again to move. Ugh. Speaking of traveling, it's weird in this version. Every path seems to be far shorter and have less stuff in it. If it is nighttime and you stop moving, you immediately start resting and, in fact, cannot interact with the environment at night. The night birds in this, when they bother to show up at all, are so slow and easy to hit that I had no problem taking care of them the two times that I saw them. The monks that say a system-specific message on the ST and Apple II say, C64? Well, this is a choice. It sounds pretty derogatory, doesn't it? Like the monk is saying, why are you using a C64? Well, whatever. People can choose whatever they want. You have a bar that shows you what you're interacting with, which is nice, I suppose, though it's oddly worded sometimes. Answer a question, such as when you leave a location and it asks if you want to save. It turns into a loading bar while the game is loading, so that's what you'll see the most often. The locations look like much colorful, solid versions of the Apple II version. They don't use any wonky patterns here. I had plenty of health, so I started the money-making trade route right off. In Perimin, I used the healers a few times, and boy is that slow, almost a minute each time visiting the healers. By the way, those healers and the monks outside look just like one of the icons from Wizard's Crown, another SSI game that came out around the same time period. I also talked to bypassers, and here comes a kid. No wait, that's a halfling? But that's what kids look like in the version I played. So is that why the kids are all chubby in the ST version? The combat is just bad, though. What is with these silly sounds? I swing my sword at a fanatic and laser beam, blip, beam, blip, beam, blip. Then a weird chunky sound when I get hit, like someone was tripping over a bunch of logs. What are these sounds supposed to represent? And why does the entire game completely lock up every time there's a sound effect? It makes it so much slower. I had a fight with three goblins, and this fight took over four minutes of just me pressing S right bracket, S right bracket, over and over again. The subsequent K-plant battle took only three and a half minutes. S right bracket, S right bracket, S right bracket. This is the MS-DOS version, released in 1987. 
It uses CGA graphics, so it's a bit hard to make it look even remotely presentable, especially since modern emulators don't emulate the color model used back then. In essence, we get four colors with a tiny ability to slightly change them. The intro is the most simplistic of the non-ST versions, not that it's interesting in the first place. I only had to play this one for 45 minutes to get as far as the C64 version. I played this in DOSBox at about a thousand cycles, so a little fast for computers back when it came out, which made the game marginally more playable. For examples, locations visibly draw on the screen like the Apple II version, but it only takes about a second to do so. Battles are blessedly fast, in quotes, because it's still boring and takes too long. You zip along when traveling at full speed. Look at him go! And there's pretty much no loading time because this is being run on a hard drive. Does any of this help the game much? No, not really, but it does make it marginally more tolerable. Just prepare for some eyesores and lousy internal speaker sound effects. The locations all look a lot like the Apple II counterparts, albeit with less colors. However, trundling into town or into buildings is just as slow as the other versions. In Primin, the bypassers are really slow and even spend extra time walking around you after you talk to them. The healer heals you for random amounts each time. The first time I visited them, I got over 1200 endurance, then a whopping 118 the next time. When you go to a tavern and answer yes or no to the questions, randomly there's a 1-3 to three second pause for no known reason. When you're in a shop and selling, it tells you how many of the thing you have to sell, but doesn't tell you how much gold or the max you can buy of something, so you have to remember it from your inventory. Speaking of inventory, that switches to the wide 40x25 text mode with its enormous text. When you want to travel, first you are presented with the map like normal. The compass thing at the upper right shows the directions the roads lead from where you are. You choose a direction to go with the number pad instead of two character codes like the other versions. If you press a wrong direction, it changes to this confusing screen. Okay then. Traveling just whizzes you along, especially if you're moving at full speed. Oddly enough, it only takes four fatigue per five miles instead of eight like all the other versions. If you talk to the months that normally talk about the Apple II, here they simply say SSI forever, so apparently the PC doesn't even get a mention at all. Well, this is a choice! When night hits, it's a sudden shift, the horizon vanishes, stars appear, the trees turn from green to cyan, and your text changes from yellow to white. Nightbird battles are also sped up, by the way, and somehow shooting at them only makes them move faster. More fleeing it is! The battles here are much faster, and when you press S to attack with your sword, the game actually says attack direction, instead of just having the letter S appear with no indication of what's going on. This doesn't help the combat actually be interesting though. It still takes a long time of just pressing S in a direction, hoping you won't die in the interim. And I can't imagine doing this K-Plant fight at normal speed. Look at how much space they put around my character to have to run up and stab at the left one. And during the short time I played, once when the night turned into day, the graphics completely bugged the crap out. I reached Feldor Forest shortly afterwards, which cleaned up the mess, but wow, that was awful looking. I was worried the game was going to crash and I'd have to restart. The Atari ST version is remarkable in comparison to the other ones. The redone graphics really shine in comparison. My favorite feature of the game, the unique locations, really looks a lot better here as well. I just wanted to take a moment to compare some things. This is what the starting village looks like in all four versions. This is your inventory. This is the world map. This is the first town, Telbiz. This is the town south of Telbiz, Zayad. This is the village west of Telbiz, Perimen. I didn't survive to get here in the Apple II version, and I'm not going to grind for the one to two hours it will take to survive the K plants on the way here. This is a temple of Dragos and fighting fanatics. This is a traitor. This is a tavern. And a weapon shop. This is what traveling down the road looks like as day turns into night. And then fighting nightbirds. This is what Feldor Forest looks like fighting the K-plants. The graphics, the sound, the feel of the game, it's all better on the ST version, aside from the game being really slow, which it was elsewhere anyways, well except for the DOS version. None of these was remarkable for an ST game, but in comparison to these other versions, I feel I played the clearly superior version here. And I still hated it. Shortly after Rings of Zilfin was released, Ali Adebek created his own company named Minecraft, which first released The Magic Candle, which came out in 1989. The company was mildly successful for a few years and then just seems to have vanished in 1993. 
Sadly, the only source I have for what happened to Ali Adebek afterwards is from the CRPG Addict blog, so none of this may be accurate. In 1994, he moved on to Interplay and worked on Waterworld before he stopped working on computer games altogether. Back when the log post was made in 2012, he was working as a developer for iFinity, which creates software for the eye care industry. Strategic Simulations Incorporated, or SSI, originally got started making various war games. I didn't really play war games, so this isn't what interested me in the company. It was after 1985 when they started releasing role-playing games, starting with Fantasy and Wizard's Crown, that a whole new class of gamers started playing their games. In 1987, they got the license to produce games based on TSR's D&D universe and released Pool of Radiance, which started a whole series of gold box games. My personal favorite being the second one, Curse of the Azure Bonds, as it had a strong plot through the game and a superior Atari ST release. Aside from the myriad of gold box D&D games, SSI released lots of other D&D games such as Eye of the Beholder in 1991 which had two sequels, three games in 1993, Dungeon Hack, Fantasy Empires, and Dark Sun, and Ravenloft and Manzab Branzan in 1994, all fun and memorable games that I played growing up. Unfortunately, that's about when they started going downhill, because in 1994 they were acquired by Mindscape, not to be confused with Ali Adebek's Minecraft, mind you, which was already on shaky grounds itself. They were subsequently sold to the learning company in 1998, then Mattel later that same year, before finally ending up being owned by Ubisoft in 2001, which just disbanded the brand. Apparently, Rings of Zilfin managed to sell 17,479 copies according to the only source I could find with sales figures. For SSI, it came out after Fantasy, which sold over 50,000 copies, and around the same time as Fantasy II, which sold over 30,000, and Wizard's Crown, which sold nearly 50,000 copies as well. Looking through SSI's RPG offerings for 1985 to 1987, only Realms of Darkness, another RPG adventure game hybrid by SSI, sold fewer copies at just 9,022. It was the hit Pool of Radiance in 1988 that first sold over a quarter million copies for SSI and really brought their RPGs to the forefront, at least for a while. Having played just about every RPG SSI released as I was growing up, I really miss how varied and unique their role-playing games were. I felt like SSI was growing up with me, getting more interesting and fun as I got older, so when they came out, they were just right for me at the time they came along. Except, you know, Rings of Zelfin and the really bad Heroes of the Lance, because seriously, screw those games. You know, I wanted to talk about awful games like this because it'd be shorter, easier episodes where I could just point and laugh at something I hated. Except then I have so many things to bitch about, I don't stop talking. Well, there goes the idea that these are going to be easier or short. The next game is a weird, simple kids game. That'll be short, right? Right?